Uh, ladies and gentlemen, so now we begin with our next session. Thank you very much for joining us back. Requesting everybody uh, to please uh, join us back in the hall. Uh, we begin our next session on embracing skill-first approach, the role of government, business, and academia. A very powerful packed session. For that, I would like to invo uh, invite on stage Mr. Bobby Kuriakos, Conference Chairman and Convener, CI Maharashtra State uh, Skill Development Panel, and Director HR Post Marshall. Uh, he will be joined uh, online uh, by Ms. Bettina Scala, uh, President, World Employment Confederation, and SVP Head Group, Public Affairs, ADECO Group. We also have with us Dr. Swati Muzumdar, Pro-Chancellor, Symbiosis Skills and Professional University. Mr. Yogesh Patil, Director, Maharashtra State Board of Skill, Education, Vocational Education and Training, Government of Maharashtra. Mr. Harjinder Singh, Director, Directorate of Skill Development, Government of Madhya Pradesh. Requesting all to please join us on stage. Thank you. Requesting Bobby, sir, to please take care of the session. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we will basically uh, start with the session. And uh, as expected, most of the, many of the delegates are still outside having lunch. And I get very scared of this post-lunch sessions. Uh, I call them as graveyard sessions, because half of us tend to fall a little asleep as well. But we have an interesting panel today for uh, the panel discussion. And uh, I would like to basically uh, uh, Welcome the entire panel. Uh, first, we have uh, <coughs> Bettina Shella, President, World Employment Confederation and SVP, Head Group Public Affairs, ADECO Group. She's online from Zurich. So uh, welcome, Bettina. Uh, is she there? Or? Uh, yeah, hi, yeah, hi, yeah. hi. It's such a pleasure. Hello. Good to, good to see you. Uh, well, so uh, Thank you so much for joining, Bettina. Real pleasure to have you. And uh, you know, to, we are looking forward to hearing your views. Let me introduce with the rest of the members in the panel. We have Dr. Swati Muzumdar. Swati is Pro-Chancellor, Symbiosis Skills and Professional University. Uh, so Swati has just uh, arrived from Pune. Uh, uh, one specific thing which I wanted to mention is Swati is also my batchmate in uh, when we were doing our <coughs> MBA course. So that's another connection we have. We also have uh, Mr. Yogesh Patil, Director, Maharashtra State Board of Skill, Vocational Education Training, Government of Maharashtra. Thank you so much for being there. Uh, we were interacting in the morning. And you know he's quite known to most of us in the room because of the different initiatives the team has been taking on in the state of Maharashtra. And then we have Mr. Harjinder Singh, IAS. He's director, directorate of skill development, government of Madhya Pradesh. You know, when you meet up with some people, you tend to get the vibes, the vibration of how passionate about they are about the area which they are handling. And I got those vibes in the morning when we were interacting. <laughs> and uh, he has said that, you know, come what may, hearing the stories from Pune, he said he will come to Pune and visit all of us, the companies over there. And uh, Swati, you can expect a visit from him too, because I mentioned about you as well. So on behalf of uh, CII and my personal behalf, I ex extend a warm welcome to all of you for the session, embracing skill-first approach, the role of government, business, and academia. It's indeed a privilege to have with me the dais, this distinguished panel. And at the same time, uh, uh, about the topic, this is a topic which has always been in uh, discussion all around. I remember heading one panel about 25 years back uh, uh, in one of the CIA forums. Uh, we were having a mod I was a moderator. And the basic transition, what I've seen is that at that particular point of time, whenever we, have, we had bureaucrats, members from the academia, and also the members from the industry joining together, at that particular point of time, it used to be like in a, in a nursery school when children are put on the stage to dance. Uh, they tend to dance to the same tune in different formats, and that used to be the kind of mode. Today, a lot of things have transitioned. 
into more of a rhythmic thing. There is a good high level of fusion which is coming in with about the thought processes between the uh, academia as well as uh, the industry as well as the support which is coming from the government with regard to the different initiatives which are there. And that's precisely we wanted to discuss today. And uh, just to briefly mention about few specific things as far as uh, this particular topic is concerned, and then I will hand it over to the uh, panelists to give their basic views. One particular important thing what I have always noticed is that, you know, knowledge is something which all of us are in alignment with regard to the criticality of that particular aspect. But at the same time, the expectational differences between what industry expects, what the academia provides, and what kind of support or the system that the government creates to have a better alignment between the two becomes a question mark, and we have heard many of the speakers talking about in the morning. Just to give you a perspective, if you look at our country, uh, India, in 2021 data clearly shows we had 21.5 lakhs undergraduates passing out under the STEM scheme. And the, under the STEM scheme, this does not include the medical, uh, medical side. We had around 6.1 lakhs of postgraduates passing out under the STEM scheme. And we, have, uh, we had around 25,000 PhD scholars passing out under the STEM scheme. But at the same time, the employability of the whole population which is passing out has been something which is more of a challenge. And there are many questions and concerns raised about it. And many of, the, many of us from the industry end up in having to set up finishing schools or uh, a second round of training as far as they are concerned. We were discussing about it uh, in the morning when we were meeting as a small group. And those are some of the areas we wanted to basically focus on and hear as to what is it that we could do differently compared to what we are doing today. And it is extremely important from the country's point of view that we need to have a highly trained skilled workforce which the industry can bring in and the learning curve as far as they are concerned has to be very very limited so that the money which is being spent by organizations in training these people to their own requirement can be minimized and they start contributing from the day one when they join the organization with this basic introduction i would now uh, basic uh, request the panelists to share their views and we'll go with ladies first. So uh, first I would request uh, Bettina uh, who is in virtual mode to give us uh, her viewpoint and my request is due to the paucity of time uh, if all of each one of us can restrict to around five minutes and then we can get on to uh, certain questions and answers and then further discussions. Over to you Bettina. I think she's frozen. Okay, I think there's some uh, issue about the connectivity. So uh, we will move on to Swati. And uh, after Swati completes her uh, uh, points of view, then we can move on to Bettina. So over to you, Swati. If uh, you can specifically cover on the point which I had mentioned to you that which will be interesting to the group that since you have started the Symbiosis Skills University in Pune and are working closely with the industry to run skill development courses, how are you embedding idea and technology related curriculum into all your courses? And uh, that's the first part of my question. And the second part of my question is that how do you engage with industry and what is also the support you are seeking from industry now when it comes to running these skill development courses aligned to the future of work? So uh, just to uh, give a preface or an opening remark, I think skill development is, um, is extremely important uh, now more than ever before. And as Bobby pointed out in his introductory remarks, I think it is time for 
industry and academia to come together with uh, the objective of uh, converting this demographic dividend, this large pool of youth that our country has, into an asset before it becomes a liability. Uh, the, to address the first question about technology, uh, I feel that technology needs to be part of our DNA. It cannot be classified separately. And therefore, it is extremely critical while uh, doing training of students, of youth on various skills and competencies, that we also train them on the future skills, on the digital skills, on the technology aspects. At uh, the Symbiosis Skills Universities, we have ingrained technology-based training in all our courses be it skills like artificial intelligence or data science, be it Python or our business analytics, uh, various other uh, digital skills. We ensure that students get warmed up to these skills as a compulsory part of all their training. Uh, I also feel that technology should be used in a big way to deliver training. And therefore, we have been one of the pioneers to incorporate online training, blended learning training within our education system. And this is also true with the skill-based training that we do. Uh, another important component is uh, that when you incorporate technology, we need to also make sure that the cost of education does not go up. So I think it's a very important uh, point that all of us on this side of the table need to remember that technology has to get cheaper and it has to make the processes more efficient. Uh, to answer the second question on, uh, would you like me to answer that now? Or, uh, so I'll just go back to the second um, question. So uh, the second question was about the support that we are seeking from the industry. So uh, here are a couple of points that I would like to bring very quickly is that the skill training has to actually emerge out of the industry requirements. It is very important for those in the training world to know what are the job roles and what is the requirement of manpower from the industry. Having that knowledge, then we also need to find out what are those skills required in the students so that they can perform in those job roles effectively. So the uh, launching of courses in skill training itself should be driven by industry demand. This is the first point. The second point is that industry needs to work closely in the delivery as well. So in Symbiosis, we are not only involving the industry to train our students, but we also send the students every year for internships so that they can understand the workplace, the life at workplace more closely. And unlike the regular internships, I think industry can play a very important role in having the students work on life problem statements, which will be a win-win situation for both parties. Even before cho students choose skill-based courses, there is a need for advocacy. Many students take up courses in education because their friends are doing it or because their parents push them to do it. So I think it's very important for the industry to help academia, to help skill universities to do this advocacy of what are the job roles and what kind of skill-based training and education these students should obtain. We also involve students uh, uh, for uh, not only uh, undergoing internships, but also the skill assessments, which is an, a unique component where the industry is engaged to assess the skills of the students so that they can ascertain whether the students are ready or not. And last but not the least, I think it's extremely important for uh, industry to get engaged not just for placements, which is of course the end result, and academia always comes to the industry for this, but also in other areas like innovation, mentorship, where they can engage in a much closer manner 
with skill training providers to help students uh, start their own startups. Uh, I feel these are some of the areas where industry and academia and skill universities especially can come together so that we can train students on the latest skills, on the future skills, so that they can be employable readily and they can be industry ready from day one so that no time is further required for their training. Thank you. Thank you, Swati. That's quite an insi insightful one, especially on the skill assessment part, what you mentioned. Uh, with the help of the industry, I think uh, uh, that's something which is going to uh, be uh, a focused activity as far as many organizations are concerned. And I know that many companies are already doing it. Uh, 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 we will now move on to move back to Bettina. Bettina, are you there? Are you able to connect? No? Okay. So then, then we will uh, move uh, now the discussion to, uh, I am not too sure whether she will be able to connect, but uh, next we will move on to uh, Mr. Yogesh Patil. Uh, so uh, first and foremost, if you could give your basic comments on uh, the entire theme, what do you feel about it? And second is, you know, Maharashtra state has always been ahead when it comes to skill development, which we all know. So how do you see its future? And what's the way forward? And how are you trying to integrate it with the world of IT? Because you know, all the youngsters, when you talk to them today, they are talking about uh, being in the IT field. But at the same time, they have limitations with respect to their basic qualification. So how are you planning to integrate the ITIs with the basic requirement of IoT and uh, IA and uh, rest of the IT-related topics, if you could throw light on? Yes. Thank you, sir. So thank you, Bobby, sir. And thank you, everyone, for inviting the state of Maharashtra Skill Development Department to this uh, conference. So th since we are into a skilling ecosystem, the industry and institutions cannot work differently. They both have to join hands together. You all are industry persons. You know the basic uh, importance about the raw material when you are involved into any, any, uh, any type of manufacturing activities. If your raw material is very good, then your manufacturing and your quality of the product will surely be good. Since the human resource in the organization is very critical, we have to join hands together for making the students more skilled. Their attitude has to be developed. And that is the reason why my department, our directorate, has been continuously working with all the industries in Maharashtra including the industrial association. So uh, with CII, we have been associated. I am in the department from 2013. And I think that the, from the day one itself, I have been interacting with CII and getting connected with various industries. So the role of industry starts with the selection of the courses. Because we, as in state government, we can provide good infrastructure. We can provide good funds. But when it comes to our domain, domain knowledge, we always has to depend on the industries. So starting with the course curriculum, selection of the course curriculum, even if it is not course curriculum selection, we can have a partnership by upgrading the course curriculum. We can add some training programs into that. There are a number of examples which we have implemented in the Maharashtra. So uh, it starts with the course curriculum designing. We have just now designed a curriculum in diploma courses for in with help of Kamath uh, hospitals, uh, hospitalities. We have designed course curriculum with help of Kokila Ben Hospital. So there are a large number of examples where we started with designing of the course curriculum, upgradation of the course curriculum. And then it comes to training delivery. So we have partnered with large number of industries also. So whether it's an introduction of technology in the curriculum, uh, in, the, in the pedagogy, whether it's training the students on various technology or adopting the technology for training the students. It comes to OJT, we have been continuously associated with Tata, Tata Strive and Siemens. I'm just citing you an example that we are not talking only theory. We are just giving you an example where we actually implemented the sorts of partnership with various industries. So we are associated with Tata Strive, with Siemens and been implementing OJT across almost 10 different type of trades across almost 13 districts in the Maharashtra. So when it comes to OJT, initially the industries were hesitating to take our students. They were saying that it would, it would disrupt their manufacturing activities. But now they are seeing this, our students, as a source of human resource because they are ultimately semi-skilled. You require skilled labor, but we, you are getting a semi-skilled where the students are actually performing in your shop floor. You have a one month or two month period where you can test these students and then ultimately you can offer them for a job opportunities later on. 
we have started DST, that is dual system of training, into various modes. The central government has initi uh, initiated one DST program, but we have trickled it into, uh, we have just customized the training program as per the requirement of various industries. We have offered apprentice training programs across industries. National Apprentice Promotion uh, Scheme is funding a part of uh, the stipend which are, which are borne by the industries, but we have come ahead and provided our Maharashtra Apprentice Promotion Scheme where we are giving additional benefit of 3,500 rupees per month per student to the industry. We just want to motivate the industries also and motivate the students also that the apprentice engagement is a part of training program. There are a large number of industries who are actually not providing job opportunities directly to the students, but they are making entrepreneurships out of the students. For example, we are working very closely with PD Light. You all might know about PD Light. They are not just manufacturing Fevicol, but there are almost 700 different type of products which they are manufacturing. And using these products, there are large number of women entrepreneurships uh, opportunities growing up in the market. Amazon is there who is providing a large number of opportunities for entrepreneurship. So we have associated with industries not only for providing job opportunities but also to develop entrepreneurship. We want industry to come forward for assessment purpose. In, in, in ITIs, in our certificate programs, in our diploma programs, the basic objection about industry is that you are not getting good quality of the students. We are just, we are, we just want you to come in front, deputy your subject experts when we are conducting our practical exams, they put your subject experts for our assessment. So that helps us to ensure that we, pro we uh, that the quality of the training is as per your requirement, the assessment is as per your requirement. Because now we cannot share our responsibility. I cannot say that industry is not engaging my student or industry cannot say that I am not providing the quality of the manpower that they are requiring. We just have to join hand together so that we can develop our own youths into a, into, into a skilled manpower which is as per your requirement. So coming to your second question that is IT related. So I know that your chat GPT, your AI machine learning is surely going to replace the technology. But skilled manpower, basic, ma basic skilling or the jobs which are required for manufacturing there, you require a skilled manpower where, where we are already engaged into various ITIs and our vocational training institutes. But we are not only restricted our training activities to our traditional skills like for fitter, turner and carpentry. We are coming forward for introducing a new type of a new age courses like IoT. So we have introduced IoT not only in agriculture sector but in hospitality, in hospital management and into smart cities also. Further we have launched curriculums uh, like drone technician, mechatronics, AI machine learning is already the part of that. I'll just cite one example of statistics. When I joined this department in 2013 and I was handed over an admission of ITIs. So we have a higher and technical education department just next to our office. So we have to inquire them that when is your diploma's last round so that we can schedule our round after diploma round because students were not coming to ITI. Now since last two years, the diploma and higher technical education ask us when is your ITS last round because we want to conduct, we want to schedule our uh, admission program accordingly. The basic difference is, the, the point I want to highlight here is students are motivated towards skill training programs. For 1.6 lakh seats at ITI, we are getting 3.5 lakh uh, applications every year. Not only from 10 standard pass uh, applicants are applying to us, but we are getting applications from the graduate. So th now the scenario is totally changing. Since we are not only offering traditional courses, we are also offering new age courses. Large number of students who have done their graduation into regular higher education system, they are also coming to us or looking forward to us for the gap courses which are into various sectors, not only IT, but ITES into new age courses, into various service sectors. So sir, we have a bunch of courses which, where we, we can offer. The only thing is that you are our customer, you have to come to us and ask us what is what customized product you want from us. We are ready, we are open for all sort of uh, models. Honorable Minister sir was uh, also here in the, mo in the morning session, my uh, Commissioner sir was also there. So we at the Skill Development Department are totally open for whatever customization you require either at the training purpose or at the assessment or at the design of the curriculum. Thank you sir. Thank you so much and this is uh,
quite reassuring from the point of view of uh, the uh, industrial representative, industry resp representatives who are here. Yeah, yes, we know that you know there is a lot that we should also be able to add on uh, and to support these uh, initiatives which are being taken. Uh, and uh, let's hope that you know that if there are any kind of clarifications when we move on to the questions and answer session with the uh, 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 participants at that time, we can address those. Uh, if is uh, Bettina back or? Yes, I'm back. Ah, hi, Bettina. I'm so sorry for I this disruption. That's the beauty of technology, right? Sure. Yeah, that's right. Uh, it can be naughty sometime. Uh, yeah. uh, Bettina, uh, just wondered your comments, uh, which I sent to you in advance. You know, investing in skills is emerging as the most productive outcome for any organization. What mm -hmm. is your thought on companies that adopt a data-enabled human-first approach to workforce transformation? I'm asking you this because you know the, the organization which you represent and the bodies which you are in are focusing really on some of this uh, is what showed my research on the, them and thought of taking up some detailing from you with regard to this, Petina. Over to you. Thank you so much, Bobby. And first of all, obviously wonderful to be with you. I'd love to be there in person in Mumbai, uh, but I'm here in, in Zurich uh, at the headquarters of, uh, of the ADECO group. Um, so delighted that now the technology works. Listen, a few words about World Employment uh, Confederation. That is headquartered in Brussels and indeed brings together all the largest workforce solutions companies in the world and uh, is working very closely with national federations, with organizations that bring together those uh, um, country level and and, um, and national or regional companies as well. So of course, uh, in India, there is a wonderful uh, member of World Employment Confederation that is the Indian Staffing Federation. And I've just been looking behind your, your backs on the screens. I see Quest, for instance, who is one of the partners uh, of this uh, forum. Of course, uh, Quest uh, is uh, very involved with the Indian Staffing Federation. Lohit Bhatia is uh, the president, so delighted to see that we are connecting there. I've heard a few elements from uh, the gentleman from uh, uh, the Maharaja government. Very impressive, I must say. Also, what I was able to hear in the, um, in the little movies uh, or the big movies that were shown. I mean, it is absolutely clear that there's certain topics, right, that need to be considered. And we've been involved in this. I've heard, you know, uh, we've been talking about this topic for 25 years in India, clearly uh, all around the world. And also now in the context of the G20 and the Business 20, uh, of course, this is one of the main areas that we are still looking at in the task force on uh, future work, mobility and, uh, and skills as the word says. So there's a few elements and I've heard them, right? And I think there's baselines we just have to know. In a way, no worker today has all the skills that are required. And I mean, our data shows that skills are obsolete after four years. So even if you don't get the young workers who need to be trained and need to be um, uh, brought up to par, uh, even the ones that you have currently in the workforce, there is a big uh, attention that needs to be brought on that skilling aspect. I've heard it uh, before, the absolute key is that it needs, the program needs to be demand-led. They need to be demand-led. So in a way, the supply is there, yes, but it's this fact of for too many years, too many countries and too many organizations have just skilled into the void, as we say. The programs didn't make sense. They were not connected to that need. So the companies that are succeeding are the ones that are very, very specific. And for that, of course, one thing which is key is the assessment piece, right? And this is where uh, our industry uh, steps in, companies uh, that, uh, that I represent step in. That exercise is just so valuable uh, and key and needs to be done so that you identify exactly what the need is now. Where it becomes a little bit challenging, of course, is if we think now about the skills that are needed in the future, because we know that about 30% of the jobs in uh, you know three to four to five to ten years clearly actually well don't exist yet so that is always an exciting one um there's obviously the element of certification there's the element of financing uh, it was touched on it seems like uh, in the case of uh, india and cii you have access to 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 funds to monies that is fantastic to hear 
Um, what we just see in general is that, um, um, again, you know, it's about creating the right instruments. And actually, it's about seeing all the expenses linked to skilling and training, not as a cost, but as an investment. And this is a message, a message to businesses in the room, right? If you still need convincing, which I assume is not the case, but even if you do things right, think about the bookkeeping, think about how you actually uh, showcase again those expenses linked to, uh, linked to skilling. I'd like to bring up as well, because it was mentioned, the absolute necessity of the mindset, right? The value that um, uh, all these forms of skilling and certification, which are not university led, have, uh, and I'm pretty sure with what I'm hearing that that is the case, but this is something that must not be underestimated. Uh, and for businesses, of course, uh, it's an important one, mainly those businesses that create their own certification together with the partners and together with uh, uh, the trading institutions is, is make sure that the certificates are, are you know, obviously recognized and are obviously seen in the broader architecture of, of yeah. skilling and certificates uh, that your country has, and ideally as well, that are recognized uh, across uh, the borders. You're saying now, we should have a to, macro perspective, that's right? Absolutely. When it yeah. comes to um, the um, topic of uh, adopting data-enabled and human-first approach, um, it's clear. I mean, we all suffer the consequences of the unskilled workforce, but what we still see is not all act on it. And actually, it's a question of, of size there. Uh, and that's why it's absolutely key, again, uh, to look at uh, the right frameworks that are being uh, created by uh, by the government, which is, again, what, what the B20 uh, is about as well. Sure. Now, if we look at what uh, the companies do, one, they place the workforce-related topics at the highest strategic level in their company. It's something that we've seen since COVID that really has accelerated heavily. Uh, and actually what we even see now is that chief HR officers are starting to be CEOs of company. Uh, here, of course, uh, very proud to cite notably the example of, of Lina Nair, your own uh, Lina Nair, who is the CEO of, of Chanel yeah, yeah. in France. That is a good example of how important, and that's what companies do, right? Uh, it's obviously about professionalizing the HR and, and learning and development department. It's about uh, expenses being related to uh, an investment and not seen as a cost. And then it's about working with the partners that can actually execute. And sure. here, I've got a, a figure for you in uh, India uh, only, 54% of the workers that um, are in uh, related to the agency work uh, industry, 54% are actually being uh, trained. That is a number well uh, close to uh, over half a million, so around 640, 650,000. So that is absolutely key. And then the so last Bettina, comment I'll make at this Bettina, stage is uh, it's important to do things right. Right. It's yeah. important to look at um, um, uh, taking into consideration um, uh, the right uh, uh, um, compliance frameworks, looking at how uh, artificial intelligence is used, notably you, the, the data angle. So this is where just focusing on uh, not being biased, focusing on applying the right um, uh, ethical standards in the use of AI as well is absolutely key. Let me leave it here for now, Bobby, and happy to yeah, take other questions. Sure, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for sharing that. And, you know, of course, I do hope the task force on mobility and future work uh, will be able to add a lot of value with respect to the entire field. And uh, Mr. Harjinder Singh has been waiting for long. Uh, uh, we'll, uh, uh, you know, the question to you, which I, you know, uh, requested you to share, uh, to throw some light on, coming to Madhya Pradesh, a lot of new exciting developments have happened over here. Uh, just for the, the information of the participants, we try to get uh, representatives from uh, Madhya Pradesh, Gujarat, sorry, Goa, as well as Maharashtra. Uh, the Goa uh, nominee could not join at the last moment. So if you could just throw some light into your global skill, skill park, what you're planning, plus some of the other initiatives. Thank you. Thank you, Bobby. Uh, I think, first of all, thanks for the invitation. Uh, 
I believe uh, uh, I've been patiently uh, listening uh, since morning uh, uh, to all the speakers, all the distinguished guests here. There has been largely a consensus that uh, skilling has to be the focus, uh, uh, you know, uh, in the in the macro uh, economic framework. Also, uh, as somebody was saying about, if we have to achieve some uh, particular level of you know uh, nine trillion economy and uh, a particular timeline, the skilling has to be the focus. But you know, the if I go uh, slightly into uh, a deep dive exercise, so uh, you have to. If I see the entire focus on skilling, so I, I would like to break it into, uh, you know, into small parts. Uh, there is a question of access to uh, technical uh, education, skilling. Uh, there is the issue of quality. And there is the issue of, you know, uh, how good uh, we have been able to, you know, find the OGT apprenticeship or internship, whichever way we want to put it. Now, I can see that in terms of numbers, uh, Maharashtra uh, Commissioner uh, Sir in the morning talk uh, had a, he was talking about thousand ITIs. Uh, Madhya Pradesh I can say like 500 government private including. So number is obviously not the issue. Number you go anywhere in the country, so you have you know ITIs in every nook and corner of the uh, in the state. In fact, my own state have a policy now that even the tribal unserviced blocks should have at least one ITI even in the remotest corners of the state. So obviously the number is not a problem, access is there. If you ask me quality, I was serious, uh, you know, uh, uh, without mincing any words. So quality is something which is, you know, missing. And I would like to uh, put the global skill park thing in the context of quality. And I would like to, uh, Bobby, uh, point out, you know, the nuts and bolts of how to set up a skilling institution. Now this I am saying from a personal experience, I joined as a project director of Madhya Pradesh Skill Development Project in March 19. That's more than four years now. Uh, going into a little bit of history of Global Skill Park and Madhya Pradesh Skill Development Project, Honorable Prime Minister was in a college called ITE Singapore. They have got three campuses, Eastern Campus, Western Campus and the Central Campus. So Prime Minister Modi went to the Institute of Technical Education Central Campus. That was followed by the visit of my Honorable Chief Minister Madhya Pradesh. And thereafter the ADB came into the picture. They gave a loan to the government of Madhya Pradesh. Government of Madhya Pradesh contributed. Cutting the whole story short, the Madhya Pradesh Skill Development Project was, you know, a $240 million package. With that, we upgraded 10 ITIs across the state. We made them mega ITIs. We call it like the hub and spoke model. So 10 ITIs as a hub and the other ITIs as the spoke. The Global Skill Park was thought of as an apex institution. Uh, you know, I, in the everyday, you know, in the conversations that we have with people, I, I passed out of Punjab in college, Chandigarh, 20 years back. People say that, you know, Harvards and Oxfords are missing. So I say that, is there any Harvard or Oxford of skilling in the country? So, you know, people, if you want to create an aspirational technical education system, you need a Harvard and Oxford of skilling. You need a global skill park. What we proudly say that we are going to give it back to the nation as the Prime Minister visualized, appreciated, admired. The direction was very clear from the top. We want to create a similar institution, what the Singapore had, what the Prime Minister saw, what the Chief Minister saw. Now, the important thing is that you have to understand the nuts and bolts, as I mentioned. The nuts and bolts, you, when you go into slightly more deep dive exercise, and as the first step that we did, once we signed the loan and the project agreements with the Asian Development Bank, we took ITE Singapore as our knowledge partner. Now, when they do consultancy, they become ITE ES, Institute of Technical Education, Educational Services. Now, as I was listening since morning, that industry will not have time to train and the institute will not have the si similar kind of infrastructure what you see in the industrial shop floor. So where lies the solution? The solution lies in a philosophy which IT Singapore says and they beautifully coined a world called authentic learning environment. Now that says that you enter a technical education institute, a global skill park, you should not be able to differentiate 
whether it is a skilling park or whether it is an industrial shop floor. Now they call it the authentic learning environment. That the global skill park idea is based on finishing school. It's based on the idea of making people industry ready. It's based on the idea of making the skilling system aspirational. Not to miss the point, as Swati and my colleague from Maharashtra mentioned, industry relevant curriculum is the heart and soul of everything. When we started planning for courses, trades in Global Skill Park, I told the IT team very clearly, you may be the master of, you know, everything, whatever do you would have done in Singapore. The founding father, they proudly mentioned, you know, Lee Kuan Yew, 1972, 2000, from third world to first world. It's an inspiring story. Whenever people talk about, you know, Dubai, Singapore, or maybe any South Korea, Japan, so we say like Asians can also do things, you know, better than the world. Singapore is an inspiring story. But when it came to, you know, creating curriculum for India, I told the ITS team, better talk to the industry in Pune. Come down to Chennai, come to Bangalore, come to Delhi. Talk to the Aero City guys, talk to the DLF Emporio, talk to the IT industry in Bangalore, the automobile giants in Hosur and Chennai. We will not accept, even if you are the perfect people on planet, talk to the Indian industry. If they have something to say on your curriculum, please make it a point to add the curriculum, you know, to whatever my industry says. Now, the, the bottom line, the crux of the story is, it starts with the industry, it ends with the industry. Probably no other department is dependent on industry to the extent which a skilling department is, you know, dependent on. So, uh, you know, uh, not taking much time, uh, I will uh, hand it back over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Singh, for this uh, detailing as far as uh, the initiatives which are being taken are concerned. And, you know, as you rightly said, it starts with industry and it should end with industry. And uh, we have a, a big role to play in creating that awareness as well as the alignment as far as the requisite and the right skill set are concerned. Otherwise, we have many situations, you know, as I was mentioning, that we have students trained, parents spend money on training them, and fag end of it, the industry finds them uh, uh, lacking the basic skill set requirement for employment that leads to a large level of unemployment across the country, whereas there is a high demand for really focused skilled workforce. Uh, with this uh, particular uh, comments, uh, I would next, we have around 10 to 15 minutes uh, for questions and answers, and uh, I would uh, throw this forum open. So any one from, I know it is very difficult to ask a question after a heavy lunch, but at the same time, uh, if there are any specific questions from any of the uh, participants, please feel free to do so. Or if there are any comments which you would like to make, because we have the official them present here, they would really be able to take this feedback back to the uh, seniors so that you know that we'll have certain level of accuracy as far as uh, uh, the skill focus is concerned. Thank you. Can I have? Please go ahead. Yeah. My name is Vishal Sanghvi. I'm an innovator. So understand the challenge is uh, uh, we and our lunch time we have shared with a few startups here coming. So I want to share the, uh, you know my thought process. So uh, you are the right, right authority. You can go to the government, put the policy. Uh, th we, we have to make some correction into our startup system, like startups who bring with their, say, you know, their own new ideas, coming things. What is the challenge? Everybody cannot get the financial, actually. Already I have shared some of the thoughts in uh, uh, early morning. You can put over there. But another the thought process I'm sharing, like started, startup, they get a Ecomedia Connect, actually, because they bring a new idea, new product, actually. Some uh, make them, uh, you know, uh, uh, they, will be, they will get an incentive when they visit to the Ecomedia about uh, presenting their idea, about, you know, guiding about the whatever uh, things they are doing, actually. You know, so this is the important things where they are getting some incentive which is only a few thousand bucks actually, you know. Uh, early, uh, as we about, startup is all about creativity. In handloom industry, we see about how government give the incentive after sold the product. Same way, if anything happening and they upload the photograph of their participation industry to the right authority, authority will directly give incentive, some remuneration directly to their account. Nothing, nothing you know, we have to give this correction. So I'm sharing this thought process so you can go ahead with the right authority. Sure. Thank you, Thank you so much for that. I, any, any other specific comments or questions from anybody from the participants? Sir, uh, yes. I want to ask. Uh, there is a Skill India program running by the center 
and uh, it's a finding out uh, is that only 30 percent of the skilled people uh, in say three four years uh, since the program running could find the uh, uh, taker in the industry so uh, rest of uh, the people couldn't find the job and the minister in the morning also said that uh, what uh, government uh, skills the industry uh, what they want they couldn't uh, take it so what i want to ask is that uh, there is a crs program also running so this is a corporate uh, social responsibility why the corporate come forward and the skilled people uh, in the way they in the way they want it uh, whatever they can absorb, they, rest they can, uh, the, the people can find the job other, in, in the other corporates. Is the CS, CSR program can include this thing? We can, you can try that, Rish. So you are very right that only 30% of the students are being absorbed by the industry who are skilled into uh, whether it's a PM, KVY uh, scheme or our Pradhan, Pramod Mahajan Kaushalya Vikas or NULM or DPDC, whatever. The major problem here is when we are seeing, when we are saying skilling ecosystem, like uh, Sir rightly said, it start it has to start with industry and it has to end with industry. Unfortunately, an institute is there who actually imparts the training, and it remain detached both from the administration and from the industry. For example, when you are saying central government scheme or state government scheme, you, whenever we are asking or whenever we want to allocate a batches, 40% of the batches are being allocated into beauty and wellness. 40% of batches are, are allocated into apparel sector and hardly 20% of the batches are being allocated into core skillings which are actually required by our industry. The major problem is that industry remains isolated from training programs. For this reason only, Honorable Minister in the morning said that we have introduced one scheme called Kaushalya Apla Dari, that is skill at your doorstep. And in that particular scheme, we have said that any industry who want to start a training institute will be given approval through green channel process. The green channel simply means that whenever we want to affiliate any institute, they apply to us, we have an inspection, uh, three rounds of inspection, then the government issues a GR. We cut down this process and we say that if you are a manufacturing organization or a service organization and you, are, you want to start a training institute, you simply apply to us on your letterhead the same day or within two to th three days, you will be affiliated as a training institute. So training institutes, we are promoting training institutes not through the training institutes. We want industry to start their own training institute because they are the right person who can say what sort of ins uh, skill sets can be imparted, how it should be imparted, how the quality should be maintained and how the assessment can be done. Thank you so much for that clarification. And we also have a view from the private uh, sector university uh, from Swati. Swati, would you like to add? Uh, so, uh what I wanted to say is that ultimately everything depends on the quality. And most of the skill training providers run after very big numbers. When the trainers themselves do not have the skills, what kind of quality can you expect in the training? Uh, second point is although industry requires skilled manpower, they do not have time for training. And that is a reality that we and the governments must also accept that industry is busy doing their jobs and therefore they may not find the requisite uh, time and the manpower to actually engage in training. The third point is that any kind of training also has to follow a very systematic process. And if you are especially trying to deliver an, a very efficient skill training program, it is important that the trainer also understands the pedagogy of training. It is a different affair to impart a bhashan in a classroom where the faculty goes and delivers his lecture and comes out without worrying what the student has understood. In the world of skilling, it is important for the students to demonstrate what are the skills that they have acquired. And therefore, last but not the least, it is extremely important that the government uh, has a proper plan for capacity building of trainers 
who can be trained by the industry, perhaps by sending trainers to the industry for internships. Why should we only send students for internship? Why can't we send teachers for internship? I think all these approaches will slowly and steadily with a systematic plan help in improving the quality of skill training and there and then you can hope to achieve that outcome that every student who comes out of a skill training institute can demonstrate that he has acquired the skill which is useful to the industry and to the society. Otherwise, the skill training institutions will end up being conventional universities where a large number of educated youth are unemployed. Similarly, a large number of skill trained youth will also continue to be unemployed. Thank you. Thank you, Swati, for clarifying that. You know, just wanted to add one experience, uh, one practice, what we have in Forbes Marshall. Uh, as a company, over the last 15 years, every summer vacation time, we get around 60 of faculty members from mechanical engineering and instrumentation scheme to our premises. And uh, we run a week, full week program for them, exposing them to the new uh, product lines which are coming in, as well as the new technology which is coming in, in the areas of steam and instrumentation. It is a well-received program. These are all faculty members from different engineering colleges across Pune and outside of Pune within Maharashtra. And we have found that it adds a lot of value to the students because they go back to the classes, uh, to the college, and transit that similar kind of knowledge uh, more from a practical point of view to the students. Uh, we can take one more question. Someone raised the hand. Uh, yeah. Uh, one more question. I'm keeping a tab on the time as well. And I'd be happy to make a comment if I can, Bobby. So I yes, have, yes. I have thoughts for digital learning. Uh, we talked about institutes. Uh, Okay. What I want from government or this is setting up studios where uh, good studios where uh, this is uh, government says come uh, record your videos. Uh, there will be everything green screen and everything good quality camera, good mics. Take the raw videos and edit it as you want. This way uh, it is, I don't see any such institute in India as of now. It can make an impact. Uh, sure. To give an example, uh, I was going through roadside. I saw a mirror decorating guy, and he was learning from YouTube. Oh. We can also do Make okay. in India, a sure. big one. Thank you so much. Thanks for that particular input. And uh, we'll get on to the concluding part. So uh, some comments from the panelists. And uh, we'll give first chance to Bettina. You've been online uh, in the virtual yes. mode. So please go ahead, Bettina, with your last comments. Thank you so much, Bobby, and I really would so much love to be in the room. Listen, I'd like to pick up one or two things that uh, that were mentioned. One, obviously, the the quality aspect of training, right? Uh, and and that's back to my comment on on compliance as well. You know, I'm doing things uh, the right way. Sure. What I just want to clarify though is those models that work best are the ones where the big part of the training, at least half of it, is done at the company. It's done at the workplace. So you need to find this right balance between still what is theoretical and done by the trainers in training institutions and the other pieces in the company. And that leads me to another comment uh, which uh, the honorable lady made, uh, which I'm hearing in a, in a lot of countries, which is industry doesn't have the time to train. Industry needs to focus on its business. Well, that just means that the pain threshold is just not high enough yet. It just still means that, apparently, for industry, it's still okay to be very inefficient and to not have the right people and the right skills. Because the moment business knows what the exact costs are of not having well-trained people, they will give, take the time and they will continue to invest in it. So I think that that argument is one where, you know, I don't have much understanding. And of course, I'm having visibility in our industry where we work together very closely and we develop the programs uh, with, uh, with many sectors where they do take the time uh, and they do invest and they do build the programs that are being delivered inside the company. And that's why my last comment is uh, a right honorable gentleman, uh, I think it was part of the question and I hope I didn't misunderstand, but I'm going to use it. Uh, there was an association of uh, driving skilling programs as a CSR. 
skilling programs are not CSR. They are the fundament of any business to succeed. All the businesses that yet haven't made up a strategy and that haven't built programs, that haven't found the partners, that haven't found the way to finance, in my view, they're not going to make it long. So it's a little bit of a black and white, as you can see. And again, the private employment services industry, is. this is what we do the entire day. We look at what the clients need, the companies, and then sure. we get the right skills. If we don't find it, we build it together. We find the way of financing. We find the way of delivering the quality uh, training. And then we get the skilled workers into the labor market. Thank you, Bobby. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Bettina, for those comments and the inputs. And uh, basically, to uh, conclude this particular session, uh, the new generation workforce, especially the Gen Z and Gen Alpha, they are going to stay with organization which very clearly explains them the purpose of their role in the organization. And they are going to stay with organizations which are going to help them to align with that particular role by providing the right kind of kinds of skill inputs. And organizations across the world can be basically divided into three, uh, the past focused, the present focused, and future focused. About 16% are considered to be past focused, about 70% are considered to be present focused, and about 14% are considered to be future focused. And future focused organizations are the ones which have got their purpose clear. And a purposeful organization is one which has got an activated purpose, aligned culture, stakeholder orientation towards a common purpose, future leadership, and a future focus. For all of these specific criteria, if you want to have our own employees or members aligned to it, I think it's extremely important for us from the point of view of having a clear focus on what you bring into the organization and how they contribute. And for that, skilling is the mantra. And if we are aligned to the ecosystem, when I'm saying the ecosystem, basically the academicia and the official dom, um, if we integrate and synergize together, we can have a beautiful future for the entire organization and in the larger ecosystem for the entire country. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us. And hope we had, uh, we were able to add some value into the entire purpose. And uh, thank you once again, Bettina, for joining. We could have, we would have loved to have you over here. Maybe next time when you visit Mumbai, please try I'll and join us. Delhi and indoor. Yeah. So I'll be there. Absolutely. Yeah. Over to you, Pushka. Uh, thank you. A big thank you and round of applause uh, for all the panelists and the moderator, please. Uh, may I request uh, Mr. Sriram Narayanan to come on stage and felicitate our moderator and uh, the panelists. Dr. Swati Muzumda, Press Pro Chancellor, Symbiosis Skills and Professional University. Mr. Yogesh Patil, Director, Maharashtra State Board of Skill, Vocational Education and Training, Government of Maharashtra. Mr. Harjinder Singh, Director, Directorate of Skill Development, Government of Madhya Pradesh. Thank you very much for being here, sir. Yeah. And thank you, uh, Bettina. We will be definitely sending across the gift to you. And uh, thank you, Sriram, sir, Bobby, sir. Thank <laughs> you.